right, we're in a series entitled Getting in a Shape. And for those of you who weren't here for that first lesson, let me kind of explain. We're not talking about physically getting in a shape. What we're talking about in this, in this series is getting into shape spiritually. And what we mean by that is taking on the shape of Jesus. You see, that's God's purpose and God's will for you and me that we would grow into the likeness and into the image of Jesus Christ. Now what we're going to be doing over these next couple of lessons is we're going to talk about how we can do that. How we can become more like Jesus. But today I want to begin our, our lesson today, or introduce our lesson today by sharing with you six things you will never hear a southerner say. Okay? Six things you'll never hear a southerner say. First of all, number one, duct tape won't fix that. I don't think I've ever heard a southerner say that. Number two, you can't feed that to a dog. Number three, wrestling is fake. Let me tell you something. When I was growing up, man, if you'd have said wrestling was fake to my grandfather, whoo, you'd, have had a, you'd have had a match on your hand right there with, with him. He believed that stuff was real. Number four, you'll never hear a southerner say, I just couldn't find anything to buy in Walmart today. I think that every time I'm going to go, you know, it's just nothing I need. I come out $50 later with all kinds of stuff, right? Number five, and these are going to deal more with food, these last two. Number five, you'll never hear a southerner say, I'll have the grapefruit instead of the biscuits and gravy. <laughs> Amen, right, Don Purvis? Right, there you, there you go. And number six, you'll never hear a southerner say, I'll have the chicken baked instead of fried, right? I mean, as, as southerners... We love our food, and a lot of the food that we eat as Southerners is not healthy. I know that's going to shock some of you, but fried and, and covered in, in gravy and, and all that kind of stuff is, is not necessarily the best for getting you into shape physically. Now, in a similar sense, if we're going to get into shape spiritually, We've got to be careful about our diet, okay? And, and here's what I mean by that. We've got to be careful about the buffet we pull up to. What do you love about a buffet? All you can eat, right? But what else do you love a buffet? All the choices, right? I mean, there's so many choices there. My biggest concern for us as Christians is too many times, spiritually, we pull up to the wrong buffet. There are all these different choices that we're tempted with, right? We're tempted with the buffet of work, and we're tempted with the buffet of lust, and we're tempted with the buffet of, of all kinds of substances, where it's drugs or alcohol, and we're tempted to go to the buffet of maybe just stuff in general. And, and we think that, man, if, if I obtain these things, then these things are going to fill me up. They're going to make me feel so good. They're going to bring happiness and joy to my life. And you know what? It might for a little bit, but ultimately, let me tell you something, it'll leave you empty. In fact, I don't know if I've told you this story before, but in Africa, they decided they were going to grow this plant called Maru, and it thrived. In Africa. That's, that's what made it so good. It, it thrived in Africa. It, it did well. And what they also found is, man, when the people in Africa would eat Maru, they would become full. But after a while, what they began to notice is even though this plant thrived and people could eat it and they were getting full, over a period of time, the people were still starving to death. And the reason why is because they found out there was no nutrients in the plant whatsoever. And let me tell you, as we look around at the things of this world, there's plenty of stuff that we can get full on. 
There's plenty of stuff that we can say, oh man, this fills me up at least for a time being. But then what does it leave us doing? Searching for more, right? It, it, leaves, us, it leaves us feeling empty. And if we're not careful, man, eventually we can starve ourselves on it spiritually. And so that's why Jesus says... In Matthew, or John rather, John chapter 6, verse 27, he says, Do not labor for the food which what? With the per which perishes, right? This, this, this physical stuff, this earthly stuff, if that's what you're, you're pouring everything into, you need to know it's going to perish. And it's not going to fill you up. He said, But labor for the food which endures to what? Everlasting life, which is the Son of Man, or which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set His seal on Him. Don't labor for the food that perishes. Be careful about the buffet that you pull up to. In fact, let me say this. Because we're talking about transformation. We're talking about how we can get into shape, become more like Jesus. Let me tell you something. Transformation begins with a healthy diet of God's Word. If you want to be full, if you want satisfaction for your soul, let me tell you something. Get away from the world's junk food and get into the Word of God. And I'm telling you, it will satisfy you. That's what David said, right? He says, man, your word is like honey. I mean, it just, it, it's, it's so satisfying. But we got to get into it if, if we're going to be transformed. Let me, let me share with you a, a couple of passages here. And these, these verses are so important concerning the word of God. James chapter 1 verse 18. This is what James says. He chose to give us what church? Birth through the what? The word of truth that we might be kind of a first fruits of all that He created. Jesus said in John chapter 5 verse 24, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my what? Words and believes Him who sent me has eternal what? Life and will not be condemned. In fact, look at this, He has crossed over from death to life. Jesus goes on to say in John 6 verse 63, He says, The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for what? For nothing. And so He says, The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are what? Church, say it. Life. Are, are you getting this? Notice what James says. Notice what Jesus says. The Word of God can take a life that is dead. And it can transform it into something that is living. The Word of God, let me tell you guys, the Word of God will give you life. But something else the Word of God will do is it will nourish you. And it will sustain you. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4? And we're going to talk a little bit more as we go along uh, in this lesson. But Jesus is talking to Satan. And Satan is tempting him. He's trying to get him to turn some stones into bread. And this is what Jesus says. It is written, man shall not live on what? On bread alone, but by every what? Word that comes from the mouth of God. Why? Because the Word, His Word sustains us. You know, bread that we put in our body, it only lasts for a period of time and then we're what? We're hungry again. And Jesus says, let me tell you something, when you feed on my word, let me, can, let me tell you, it nourishes you. It sustains you. But something else you need to know about the word, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 2, Peter is writing... And he talks about how the Word of God helps us to grow. It helps us to mature. How many of you want to grow spiritually? 
I mean, it's kind of like when we talk about our, our kids. We, I, I think Rhett just left. He, he was crying. I guarantee you, if I were to ask R.W. or if I were to ask Heather right now, do you want Rhett to continue to do that? I mean, do you, do you want Rhett to stay, you know, little all of his life and cry and you have to change his diapers and, and you're having to constantly feed him and do everything for him? Or do you want him to grow? I guarantee you, even though they love him as a little baby, I guarantee you what they want to see in Rhett is growth. And the same is true of your Heavenly Father. He doesn't want us to stay babies, spiritual babies, all of our lives. He wants us to grow. And the Word of God does that. It helps us to grow. It helps us to become more and more like Jesus. That's why in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, Peter says, Crave the spiritual milk. In other words, crave the Word of God because it is the Word of God that is going to help us to grow up in Christ. Peter says. Okay, so look at what all the Bible does. It can take a life that's dead and, and, and give it life. Uh, the Word of God can nourish and sustain. The, the, the Word of God helps us to grow and mature. And the question is, why? And the answer is this, because the Word of God is the revelation of God. Now, for those of you who grew up in the church all your lives, you, you probably understand what that word revelation means. But for some of you, you're like, revelation, what are you talking about? What does that mean? Well, it actually means two things. First of all, it means that the Bible is a book by God. Now, some of you are probably kind of scratching your head. Well, what about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? All these people that we say are the writers of the Bible. Well, they did write the Bible, but they did so through the Holy Spirit moving and guiding these men to write what they wrote. In fact, if you look at 2 Peter chapter 1, Verses 20 through 21, it says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the white church, by the Holy Spirit, by God Himself. Okay, so when we talk about the Word of God being... The revelation of God, what we're saying is the Bible is a book by God. But also we're saying that the Bible is a book about God. This is very important. And really, this is, this is so incredible. This is... I mean, it's just absolutely amazing when, when you start thinking about this and you take this in for yourself. Do you realize that if we didn't have the Bible, our knowledge of our Heavenly Father, our God, would be very limited, right? I mean, basically, all we could do is look around at creation, look around at the universe, and, and basically, you know, most of what we can conclude about God is that He's powerful, right? Right? To be able to create all this. And, and we could assume that he would have to be very wise to create all of this. But our knowledge would be very limited. And so God gave us the Bible to reveal himself. Think about that. To reveal himself to you and me. So that we would understand and, and know the God that we serve. And, and, and really, that's His ultimate aim for us, isn't it? As Christians, to, to know Him. And in fact, let me share some scripture with you. Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 3, And this is eternal life that, that they may, what church? Know you. In other words, in order to have eternal life, then we've got to know God, and He says the only true God, and Jesus Christ. So through the Scriptures, we also know Jesus Christ, whom the Father sent. Right? 
You keep going and Jesus says in John chapter 5 verses 39 through 40, He's actually talking to the Pharisees and He said, You diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. Now remember, we said this from the very beginning, the goal, the purpose that God has given us is not to study the Bible. That's not the goal. The goal is not to, to pray. The goal is not to show up at worship. The goal is to become like Jesus, and it's through prayer, and it's through study, and it's through coming together to, to worship that we become more like Jesus. And so Jesus says, you think just by studying the Scriptures you have eternal life. He says, but these are the Scriptures that what, church? That testify of me. This is what I want to encourage you to do. And I've been guilty of this at times, but if you want to get the most benefit out of God's Word, don't read it from the standpoint of, well, I've read my Bible today, check. I've done my spiritual duty. Don't read it from the standpoint of, of got to do this, got to do that, can't do this, can't do that. Read God's Word from the standpoint of when I get into this, I get to know God. In other words, when we get into God's Word, we get to see the one in whom we are to transform into. Are you with me? You see how that makes a difference when you're studying God's Word? From, when you study it from the standpoint of, man, I want to know God. And God, in His Word, He just reveals Himself to us. He tells us what, what He's really like. And that's how the Scriptures should work in, in our lives. As we read the words of the Bible, we ought to see God. That's why it's so important that we read our Bibles on a daily basis. And, and here's the deal. When we do that, two things at least are going to happen. First of all, when we study the Scriptures, it's going to help us to say yes to Christ's likeness. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed, right? And it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in what, church? Righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice the Scriptures, they equip us. They mature us in righteousness. But let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you have ever talked to someone, or, or maybe you felt this way your, yourself before, you know, studying the Scriptures just isn't that important? I mean, it's just not that big of a deal. I mean, ignorant of, of God's Word is, you know, <laughs> hey, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I, I, I'm saved. I mean, what, is it, what does it really matter now if I study the Scriptures? Let me tell you why this is so important. Ignorant believers are much easier for Satan to pick off. What does Jesus say about Satan in John chapter 8, verse 44? He is the father of what? Lies. And let me tell you something. Lies, how many of you would agree with this? Lies are very hard to see through unless you know the truth. Am I right? And some of you, if you don't get into God's Word, you're never going to know the truth. You're never going to know the truth about God. You're never going to know the truth about yourself. I mean, there may be some of you who walked in here this morning and Satan has fed you a lie that, you know what, no one cares about me. God doesn't love me. How could God love anyone like me? I mean, all the sins I've committed, all the things I've done. Let me tell you something. Satan is selling you down the road. And you'll continue to believe his lies until you know the truth. And Jesus says in John 17, verse 17, He says, your word is truth. And so as you get into the word, you, you know the truth. You, you began to see through the lies. Paul, Paul talked about it this way. He says, until we all reach unity. This is Ephesians 4, 13 through 15. 
in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the goal. He says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up in Him who is the head that is Christ. Paul says, we've got to mature. We've got to grow if we're ever going to be able to overcome the schemes and the deceitfulness of the enemy. But if we want to grow, we've got to stay in God's Word. If we want to become like Jesus, if we want to take on His Christ-likeness, then we've got to stay in the Word. Number two, it will help us to say no to ungodliness. It was D.L. Moody that once said, Sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. And I believe that with all my heart, and, and I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you how that happens. Because a regular diet of the Word of God enables the Holy Spirit to accomplish His ministry of conviction. In other words, as we are active in the Word of God, the Spirit of God brings to mind those things that we need to say no to that the flesh is trying to get us to say yes to. And so we've got to stay in the Word of God so that we can say no. Remember what David said or the psalmist said in Psalm 119 verses 9-11? through 11, How can a young man keep his way pure? He answers his own question. By living according to your what, church? Word. Your word. He goes on, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray away from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart. Why? That I might not, what, church? Sin against you. And so what the psalmist is saying is we are putting God's word into our hearts. It helps us to overcome and to stay away from sin. This is the same thing that John basically says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. He says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong. He's talking about spiritually strong. And the Word of God lives in you. And because of that, what happens? You have what, church? You've overcome the evil one. Because God's words in your heart, you've overcome the evil one. In, in Ephesians chapter 6, we read about the armor of God. Paul mentions all the different types of armor that, that we are to have on as Christian soldiers. But there is one in specifically that he mentions that's very interesting. He says, take the helmet of salvation and the white church, the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Now I want to encourage you to go back and read Ephesians chapter 6 on spiritual warfare and all the armor of God. And what you will notice is that all the armor that is mentioned is defensive except for one. And that's the Word. The, the rest is to defend. But, but the Word of God is for you and I to use against Satan, to attack Satan with. You remember what happened when Satan came at Jesus? In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days, and Satan comes along and he says, You know, Jesus, if you really are God's son, then you know what? You should be able to turn these stones into bread. And how does, how does Jesus handle this situation? He pulls out his sword, right? And he says to Satan, he says, It is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then Satan takes him up on the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, look, just cast yourself off. You, you know the Father won't let one hair on your head be hurt. He'll, he'll send angels and they'll save you before you, you hit the bottom. How does Jesus respond, man? He pulls out his sword. And he says, it is written, it is written, he says, you don't test the Lord your God. And then he takes him up on a mountain, right? And he says, look, Jesus, if you'll just bow down to me, he says, I will give you all of this. And Jesus pulls out his sword one last time. 
And he says, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve Him. And what happens to Satan? He doesn't stick around. He'd been defeated. Right? And so the Word of God, listen, this is not to stall Satan. This is to drive him back. This is your weapon in defending yourself against him. In fact, you look at Mark chapter 4, verse 15. This is, this is kind of interesting. And, and while you're, you're looking there, I'll, I'll share this with you. The word that's used there in Ephesians chapter 6 is a, speci is a specific statement used, or it actually means a specific statement used in a specific situation when we are Tempted, okay? So, so we're going to come back and we're going to look at, look at that in just a few minutes. But if you look at Mark 4, verse 15, Jesus is telling a parable about the seeds. And he says, Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown, and soon as they hear it, who comes? Satan comes and does what? Takes away the word that was sown in them. Let me tell you what Satan knows. Satan knows that the Word of God is powerful. And if you don't believe that, ask, your, ask yourself this question. Why am I facing so much resistance in wanting to study the Word of God? Ask yourself that question. I don't want to see a show of hands, but how many of you made it your, I mean, it was your New Year's resolution. Man, I'm going to study my Bible this year. And the first week, man, you're on it. You're going through several chapters. And then as time passes, you, you start finding yourself in, you know, situations where you're busy and, and, and you don't have time. Or maybe you find yourself in situations where you're tired or you're sleepy. And now your New Year resolution of studying the Bible more is absolutely gone. Why do you think that is? I think Satan knows that the Word of God is powerful and he doesn't want you putting that in your heart. And every opportunity he gets, if we will allow him, he will come and he will snatch it out of our hearts. Let me close out with this, okay? I'm just going to share with you a couple of things that will help us to feed on the Word of God more. First of all, number one, we need to read God's Word on a consistent basis, regular basis. And what I would say to you, in, in order for all of us to do that, what we need to do really is come up with a time and a place every day. Same time, same place, every single day when we will study the Scriptures. Now, some of you say, okay, well, that's good, Slate. You know, maybe before I go to work in the morning, maybe before I go to bed. But Slate, man, I just can't sit there for hours on the end studying the Bible. Do it for five, ten minutes a day. But just take a certain time, certain place, five to ten minutes a day to get into God's Word and study it. And see if you don't fall in love with it. Now some have told me, well, Slate, man, I, I have tried to do that all my life. And every time I read this book, it's so confusing to me. I don't understand it. I don't understand the words. And what I would say to you, listen, there's nothing wrong with getting an easy-to-read translation. There are great translations out here today that will put it on your level, in your language. And I have, I have suggested several translations to several people, and people have come to me and they said for the first time, I love God's Word because I understand it. Praise God. God gave this to you to understand. He didn't give you a book for you to scratch your head and go, what in the world does that mean? He gave it to you because He wants to unveil who He is and who you can become and how you can come to Him. And He keeps it pretty simple. But if you, if you really say, man, I, I just can't get, an, get another translation that speaks to you, that you can understand. Also, bless your reading with prayer and meditation. Read some scripture 
and meditate on it. I believe it was a psalmist, it was David, it was also Joshua who said, I meditate on your word, what? Day and night. I meditate on it. And that's a lot different from just reading it. From just checking off a, a, a spiritual checklist. It's, it's thinking about it. It's, it's, it's mulling over it, you know. It's, it's chewing on it. What, what does that mean? How does that apply to me? And then pray over it. Pray about what you've read. You might even begin with a word of prayer. God, help me to understand what I'm reading today. Help me to see what you want me to see in your word. That's going to help me become more like you. Also, commit some scripture to memory. I'm not saying memorize the whole Bible because I realize for some of us, we're not even going to remember what was said five minutes from now, okay? But all of us have struggles. All of us have things that tempt us. Memorize some scriptures that will help you in battle. So that when Satan comes to you, at those weakest moments, you can pull out your sword and say, let me tell you something, Satan, it is written, and you, you quote it. You say it out loud, you let him hear it. But memorize some scripture, kind of picture your heart as, as kind of a, a, a notepad. What, what do you have written on your heart? Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, this is what Paul says, Let the word of Christ, what? Dwell in who? In you richly. So, so memorize some scripture, and then lastly, make some practical applications. Like I said, just don't read through it just to, to be reading it. In, in fact, look at what James says. James chapter 1, and then we're done. James 1, 22 through 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at a at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it will be blessed in what he does. You know, there are, there are a couple of ways that we can see what we look like. A photograph is one, right? Um, another way is a mirror. But, but how many of you would say that when you get up in the morning to see what you look like, you go and you pick up one of your photographs? And you, you look at that photograph and go, boy, I'm looking pretty good this morning. No, we don't do that, right? We go to the mirror and we look in the mirror because it's an exact reflection of who we are. And we look at ourselves in the morning. If you're like me, you look at that reflection and you go, wow, I've got a lot of work to do today. Right? And the same is true of the Word of God. You know, as we look into His Word, it's like a mirror and it shows us the things in our lives that God wants us to work on. And so we look into God's Word, and we don't do it just to, to read it, but we do it, and, and we obey it, and we apply it, because when we apply it, we begin to look like Jesus. And so that's my encouragement for all of us today, is, is to study the Word of God. You want to get into shape? You want to become more like Jesus? Get into His Word and, and see who Jesus is. See what Jesus is really like. And for those of you who may not be Christians here today, let me tell you something. As you get into God's Word, you will see that He is your Savior. He's the only one who can save you. He is the only way. And for some of you, you know, you, you need to consider this book. You need to get into it. I, I would encourage you, if you're not a Christian, to, to study it for yourself. Read it, challenge it, and just see if this book is true. Because if it's true, let me tell you something. You've got to give your life to it. 
And so this morning, there may be some of you today who need to give your life to Jesus. You need to put on Christ in baptism, having all your sins washed away. Or it may be that there are some of you here this morning, you are a Christian, but, but maybe you're, you're, you're struggling with something. And I don't know if it's physically or, or spiritually, uh, but you have a big church family here who would love to pray for you and encourage you, and I would encourage you to get into God's Word because you're going to find encouragement in it as well. And so today, if you need to respond, won't you come together we stand and sing?